Okay. So this is the last uh, lesson of this summer course. We made it to the end, and today we are uh, going to apply all of that on real data sets. Um, and I would like to, uh, yeah, recap first what we have seen. <laughs> uh, don't be sad, but we have seen until now. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, 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 we started from the problem of uh, topological inference um, and proposed a, a solution that is persistent homology. Persistent homology allows to uh, estimate, to give an idea of the topology of our underlying uh, space, the space underlying our data set. Um, and uh, this idea is given via the uh, uh, tool of homology, right? And the most two important results uh, that we've seen is first the consistency of persistent homology. Consistency means that at some point in our persistence module, we see the topology we want to estimate. And uh, the, the other result is stability, meaning that if we do not have uh, an exact uh, signal, but a noisy one, we can still obtain uh, valuable information from the persistence modules. And so this is the theory. I would like to start this uh, lesson by talking a bit about uh, developments uh, of persistent homology, because I uh, presented to you the very basic uh, theory of persistent homology, but obviously there are many, many different ideas, many different developments. Um, so in this first part, I will talk uh, more about theoretical developments than applications, uh, because my, my, my knowledge is more uh, about uh, theory, um, but you can um, interrupt me anytime if you want more precisions. I have uh, about 10, 10 little slides to, to show you. Um, so you may wonder, uh, uh, well, can we do statistics with this theory of persistent homology? Can we do, uh, can we design tests, statistical tests, um, to really, from the barcodes, uh, obtain an estimator of our homology? And we can do that. There are a lot of uh, papers about uh, how to design statistical tests. Um, so this one was one of the first ones to talk about that. So basically, at the end, you obtain something like that. Remember that um, a barcode can be transformed into a diagram just by, you know, you, you take every interval of the barcode. Uh, they have the form AB, and you consider the point AB in the plane. So uh, when you see a persistent diagram like that, the long bars in the barcode correspond to points in the diagram that are away from the diagonal, right? The more a point is away from the diagonal, the more the corresponding cycle persists. And well, so topological noise will correspond to uh, um, cycles with a small persistence that will correspond to points close to the diagonal here. And one test, one test you can uh, design is, uh, well, estimate a band like that. And you will say that above this band, you have topological information. And under this band, you have topological noise, right? So here you would say, according to this statistical test, you have three uh, homology features, right? Your homology group has dimension three. Uh, 
So this is for statistics. Um, higher dimensional persistence. This is another very important topic. What we have seen uh, in this course are filtrations indexed by the real numbers, right? We were thickening our data sets and you only need one parameter to thicken the data sets, the value of the thickening. But in some applications, uh, you end up with more parameters than simply one. So for instance, here, uh, they have a data set where, so uh, on the y-axis, you thicken the data set, but on the x-axis, you add a point uh, in these uh, kind of uh, circles, right? And these are two uh, independent parameters. So you can change them uh, how you want. And you obtain at the end a filtration of your space with two parameters. From a simply short point of view, uh, so this is a, a nice picture where in a direction you add simplices, in the other direction you add uh, other simplices. Okay. Can we uh, define a persistent homology theory for such uh, multi dimensional um, filtrations? Uh, we can, but at the end, we, would, we won't obtain barcodes. You cannot define nice barcodes for such objects. Though it's very interesting and people try to, 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 to do stuff and applications with, with that. Um, here, uh, I talk about something we did uh, three years ago. So uh, what we've seen in persistent homology is that if, um, say, uh, our, our data set is close to the underlying object, right? The persistent barcodes will be close to each other. This is the stability theorem. But in some uh, applications, your data set is not, is not close to the underlying object in Osdorf distance. In some cases, you have anomalous points. You have outliers, right? And only one outlier, only one uh, anomalous point make the Osdorf distance very large. And uh, the stability fails. So in this case, for example, as you can see in the thickenings, we do not see a, a circle. And even in this persistence diagram, well, it's not clear that we have a first homology of dimension one. Okay. Uh, though this data set here may have some uh, anomalous points, but there is a lot of points close to the circle. And actually, this data set is close to the circle in Wasserstein distance, which is a distance for uh, measures. Okay. And uh, there are ways to still do uh, persistent homology with uh, such data sets. And at the end, it looks, looks like that. So the idea is to not thicken your data set uh, uniformly on each point, but you will uh, put larger balls in, in uh, high density areas of your data set. And, and uh, well, as you can see here, we obtain a, a very nice barcodes, right? One long green bar and one long red bar that reflects the homology of the underlying circle. Okay. Um, so this is also a, a very important topic. Um, so uh, most of the usual machine learning uh, techniques work when our uh, 
data set is embedded in the Euclidean space in some Rn. Um, though persistence uh, barcodes are multisets of intervals, or the diagrams are uh, multisets of points in the plane, and multisets do not uh, embed in the Euclidean space. I mean, uh, you, you cannot uh, embed the space of barcodes endowed with the bottleneck distance in some uh, Euclidean space. Um, there is uh, still a, a way to apply the usual techniques of uh, machine learning, and this is called the kernel trick. Uh, so a kernel is kind of a scalar product you can define. And once you have a kernel, well, you, all the usual techniques are available. So there has been some work um, towards defining kernels for uh, barcodes. And this, is, this works very, very well. All right. Um, so another hot topic is also, of course, uh, neural networks. Uh, really, I, I don't know any. Uh, I don't know anything about that. So I, I just put these two papers that uh, seems uh, famous. Um, and yeah, in the second one, you have this uh, this figure. So I think they create some kind of. Uh, they call that a, a topology layer. So they add. Uh, some topological layer in, in their uh, neural network, uh, which allows to extract uh, homological information. So basically, they compute barcodes, right? And, and I think what was it proved is that in uh, these um, <clears throat> uh, neural networks, uh, adding a persistent homology layer uh, improve improve the results you, you can have. Um, hierarchical clustering. Um, so this is a, a very nice point of view on clustering. When you do uh, classification, when you do clustering, uh, most of the time you either ask for a certain number of clusters, like I want three clusters, or uh, the algorithm will choose for you the number of clusters. Hierarchical clustering in this case, um, you do not have a fixed number of clusters. It's like a smooth clustering. Basically, what you want is a dendrogram, something like that. You have uh, different values. And for each value, you obtain a different cluster, uh, a different clustering. And the greater uh, the value is, uh, the more clusters will cluster together, so something like that. Um, so this is a nice point of view when you uh, are uh, you don't know a lot about your data. Um, and what is nice is that persistent homology in uh, degree zero, zero persistent homology, uh, already is some kind of uh, hierarchical clustering, right? Because you uh, merge balls one by one. And you can build a dendrogram like that. Okay. So in practice, uh, uh, zero persistent homology is, is uh, very useful. A lot of papers only use that, zero persistent homology. Um, classification. So this is um, uh, very interesting. Yeah, so there is a lot of uh, Frédéric Chazal um, but look at these uh, pictures, it, it's so nice. So you have a, a data set like that, um, and you want to cluster according to the geometry of your uh, data set. So here, this is when you use uh, spectral clustering, right? A usual technique of clustering. Of course, your cluster does not reflect the geometry of your data set. 
but they designed this algorithm, uh, which is called uh, tomato. And with tomato, well, you do persistent homology, and you can obtain this kind of uh, these clusters, um, even even with a very noisy uh, data set, right? You really you extract the geometric objects in your data set. I think it's very very nice. And um, the question of Lucas, we call persistent homology the persistence module with the sets being the homology groups. Um, I'm not sure to understand your question. I, I call persistent homology basically the persistence modules associated to the check filtration, for instance, or yeah, or per persistent homology. When I, when I say we use persistent homology, I mean we compute barcodes. Um, we've seen the persistent homology. We've seen the barcode associated to the persistence modules associated to the check filtration and the RIPS filtration. But you can uh, design many more filtrations. For instance, here. This is in this second paper, I guess. So you want to cluster uh, animals, OK? They have horses and uh, uh, I don't know what is that, a dragon. Uh, well, there are given triangulations of animals, and uh, they want to cluster them into uh, species, right? And what they do here, they um, consider the filtration with the geodesic distance on uh, an animal. So the, ge the geodesic distance, take a triangulation, take a, a geometric object like that. The geodesic distance between two points is the length of the minimal curve that join the two points. Um, the difference with the Euclidean distance is that if you embed your horse in the Euclidean space, the shortest path always is the straight line between two points, right? But if you are on a horse, you have to follow the curve of the horse. Okay, this is called the geodesic distance. And you can uh, select a point on your animal and um, grow ball according to this geodesic distance. You obtain a filtration of your horse, and you can consider its persistent homology. And well, by doing that, they compare uh, barcodes, and they obtain a very nice classification of species. OK. Um, this is the last example I will give to you. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, Time series is also an important uh, topic in, in data analysis. Um, and a time series, so it's basically uh, a sequence of real numbers, right? x1, x2. Uh, it's hard to investigate and to understand. Um, you can do persistent homology with it. So for persistent homology, we need a point cloud in the Euclidean space. And there is a way to transform a time series into a point cloud. And this is called a time delay embedding. Uh, we will do that uh, today in the tutorial. So basically, the idea is that, say you have a time series like that. So you have a, a set of points sampled on a signal like that. And you will consider Right, you need uh, uh, some value here, n, okay? And you will consider the n tuples that consist in uh, all the sequences of n consecutive points. So this will be the first n points, okay? And then this will be the first, the second n points, etc. 
and you obtain at the end a collection of points in Rn. And the example here, so they take um, n equal to 2. They want to embed their time series into R2. And well, you would obtain something like that. A lot of points in Rn. And uh, well, sometimes it happens that the set of points you obtain has a very nice topology, right? For example, here, it looks like a circle. Sometimes you obtain two circles. There is a, um, a theoretical result about, about dy dynamical systems and uh, these time delay embeddings. This is called uh, Takens, Takens theorem. Um, and you can prove that you can say things about your uh, signal from the topology of the time delay embedding, right? So some people try to embed their time series into a, a, a Euclidean space, and then they try to estimate its topology. And, and yeah, this is, this is interesting. All right. Um, so this is it. Now I will show you uh, on Goody in practice how to do all of that. So please go to this page. There is the Python notebook and a few, a few files to download in the folder um, tutorial three. Yeah, there is a lot, a lot to do. All right. Tell me when you have been able to uh, download the notebook and the files. All right, then, if this is okay for everyone. Um, okay, so there is a first part that we'll uh, do together. And then I prepared uh, four 
uh, three small uh, exercises for you to compute your own persistent homology. Um, so let's go. It starts with these three libraries that you already know. I put uh, simply two functions here. Um, the last tutorials, there was many functions because I had to simplify your computation because you were not familiar with Goody. And now that you know persistent homology, you can do everything on your own. So the only function that I give you uh, is one to sample uh, points around the circle, right? It's very simple. And one to plot the thickenings, if you want to plot thickenings. And I will start by showing you how to um, build a filtration in Goody. So a filtration, we have seen, it's an increasing sequence of uh, simplices, right? Um, and you have to uh, associate every simplex with a value, t. For instance, uh, in, the, in the check complex, the nerve of the union of boards, the value when you insert a simplex is the moment where the balls intersect. Okay, but you can design any filtration you want in Goody. Um, so, for instance, let us build this filtration. I want to add all the points at time zero, then all the edges of the square at time one over two, and then this diagonal and this triangle at time square root of two over two, okay? So I create a simplex tree here with Goody, and then I add all my simplices, and I precise uh, what are their, their filtration value. So for instance, the first vertex zero, I want to add it at time zero, so I write insert simplex zero at time zero, or uh, when you want to insert it at time zero, you can simply uh, say anything. The, the, uh, you do not have to put the zero here. Okay. Once I have uh, inserted my four uh, vertices, I insert the four edges of the square, and a precise, I give to Goody the filtration value one over two, okay? So vertex uh, one, two, three, four. Then I add the edges zero, one. Oh, no, this is zero, one. I add the edge 0, 1, the edge 1, 2, the edge 2, 3, and 3, 0. OK. And at last, I add this diagonal edge 1, 3, and then the triangle 0, 1, 3. And I give the value square root of 2 over 2. So Goody says true. Um, when I insert a simplex, uh, it says true if the simplex was not already there in the filtration. If it were there, it will say false. But it's, I mean, if I do it again, for instance, false. But it's not a problem. All right. And now I can use the functions uh, on Goody. For instance, um, all right, before asking for a homology of barcodes or stuff like that, you have to do this function, compute persistence, okay? Compute persistence would compute the barcodes of your uh, simplex of your uh, filtration, which is called the simplex tree in Goody. And I uh, also give the 
uh, finite field over which I want to compute the persistent homology. So I say two because we studied persistent homology over uh, z over 2z in this course. Yeah. Once I have computed the persistence, I can, for instance, ask for the Belty numbers. Okay. ST, my, simplex, my simplex tree, ST dot Betty numbers. Okay. And I can read an array with two values. The first one is uh, Betty zero, and the second one is Betty one. Okay. So I can say that. Um, Where are you? Ah. I can say um, the H zero of um, the simplicial complex has dimension one, and the H one also have dimension one. And this is clear, this last simplicial complex, uh, when you do weighty numbers, you obtain the weighty numbers of the uh, last simplicial complex. And this is a circle, right? It has a homotopy type of a circle, one cycle and one connected component. Okay. And uh, we can do persistent homology. We can ask for the barcodes of this filtration. So now you are Code. I say barcode equals to persistence. When you write uh, st dot persistence, what you obtain is the barcode of your filtration. Okay, and I print here the barcode, and you can read uh, five elements. Okay, with uh, an integer at the beginning of each element. This gives you. Uh, which homology group uh, I am talking about. So for instance, these four uh, elements are bars, intervals of the uh, H0 barcode of zero homology. So you can see that you have uh, three finite bars that goes from zero to zero five and one infinite bar that go from zero to infinite, okay? A question, following the matrix algorithm for computing barcodes, should I have a bar interval for each simplex? Uh, no. First, you will pair simplices, right? So, Sometimes you will obtain less than the number of simplices. And moreover, um, if a positive simplex and a negative simplex, if a, a persistence pair are at the same filtration values, then the persistence is zero and we do not put that in the barcode. All right, if I add one point that creates a, a, a connected component and at the same time I add an edge to connect these points, I will have a connected component of persistence zero, and I do not consider this interval of length zero. This was um, in the node. Let me show you. Uh, share. I hope you can see the theorem, the proposition here. The end barcode of the filtration is the set of uh, intervals uh, t sigma t uh, tau for all the persistence pairs sigma tau that you obtain at the end of the filtration uh, of the algorithm. Such that the time of apparition of sigma is different from the time of apparition of tau. Does it imply when the, the second simplex is uh, infinite? 
yeah, uh, this is the case when the simplex, uh, well, when the simplex is infinite, then I would say I will put infinite here. to apply this, this algorithm to the last exercise and it showed uh, to me that uh, I would have more bars than the the Python tutorial shows. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm right. Maybe I did it wrong. Uh, what bars do you obtain that you do not see in the tutorial? More bars for homology, first homology. The, the zero homology is is right for me, but the one homology. What what, what bar right. what bar do you obtain more in one homology? Oh, uh, if I'm I, I will check it here. It's fast, but I, I, if I remember well, it's about that we start at zero dot zero dot five, and then end in at plus infinity. This one. Yes, more more of this mm. because of other simplices. Well, the other uh, here you until k eight you only have one cycle, and then you add this diagonal that creates a new a new cycle in h one, but it dies at the same time it is born because of this triangle. So you should have obtained a bar uh, square root of two square root of two. So we do not put in the barcode. Is that it? Sorry, uh, I I I missed the five last seconds of your hours. Yeah, I was saying that when you add this edge in the filtration, you obtain a new cycle, but then you add this triangle at the same time. The edge and the triangle, so so okay. the cycle dies at the same time it is born. Okay, I'll let you check your results and and, and you can interrupt me. Um, meanwhile, uh, uh, here this is a cell where um, I show you how to plot the barcodes, okay? So with um, Goody, you can either uh, ask for the barcode representation or the diagram representation, okay? On the left is the barcode, so you can see in red, H0, and in blue, H1. You have uh, four bars, four red bars, and they correspond to these intervals. Three of them dies at 0, 5, and one of them is infinite. Okay. And you also have this one in H1 that starts at 0, 5 and dies at infinite. And well, you can also read that in the persistence diagram. Uh, so some yeah, it is better in practice to plot the persistence diagram in some cases because it's easier to read. Uh, most of the time you have a lot of bars and, and it doesn't look well, while on a diagram you can really see points. Uh, one problem though, on the diagrams, you cannot see when you have multiple points at the same location, right? These three bars, will correspond to three points here. And, and, and well, you, you cannot tell from these representations that there are three points. So be careful when you use uh, uh, diagrams. Okay. So this was for uh, uh, homemade uh, filtration. What we are interested in mostly is uh, rips filtration, okay? So in order to uh, illustrate that, let us uh, um, generate a data set. Here, a data set um, around the circle plus some noise. Here, SD controls the noise, okay? So 
you can see how long the thickening is if you want. Um, and now we will build the RIPS filtrations. Filtration. Um, there is a little uh, a problem. Sometimes authors uh, do not use the same definition of the RIPS filtration than us. Remember that we said that the RIPS, the RIPS filtration is the click complex of the neighboring graph. Uh, so the one skeleton of the RIPS complex has an edge if uh, the length of the edge is smaller than two times t, where t is the parameter of the RIPS complex at time t. In Goody, um, they say that we have an edge if the length of the edge is simply t and not two times t. So we have to take care of that. When I create my RIPS complex, okay, I say RIPS complex, I create a RIPS structure, I give the set of points divided by two. All right. I divide all the uh, length of the distances between the points by two. So at the end, we will obtain the structure we defined in the in the course. Okay. Uh, I hope this is clear. Uh, and there is also this important uh, second argument: max edge length. Okay. It means that what is the maximal value of the parameter for the risk filtration? What is the maximal uh, radi radius of the balls? If you put uh, maximal edge length too small, you will not see the whole filtration, the whole persistent homology. If you take uh, a value too high, you will obtain a, a, a simplicial complex with many, many, many simplices. And this will be very long to compute the persistent homology. So, well, here I put one because I, I know that one will be enough. But in some cases, it is tricky to know what parameter to choose. Okay. So, uh, an advice in practice I start with small values of max edge length. And, and if I am able to compute the persistence and I see that it's not enough, I increase this parameter. Well, uh, so I create this structure, RIPS complex, and then I uh, build the corresponding simplex tree. Okay, simplex tree, this is a filtration in Goody. So I, I say RIPS, like, like here, dot create simplex tree, and I precise uh, what maximal dimension I want my simplices to be, okay? And here we are only interested in homology uh, up to dimension one. I simply want to read uh, one homology. So I add the simplices up to dimension two, okay? Well, now I have that. I can compute its persistence and plot the barcodes and the diagram. Okay, so this is what I get. What you can read is on the barcode, a lot of small uh, red bars and a large red bar. Okay, this is a zero uh, homology feature of our data set, the most important means one connected component. I can see some topological noise and a long blue bar. This is H1, okay? So if I were to interpret this barcode, I would say my H1, my H0 has dimension one and my H1 has dimension one. So this is basically a circle homology wise. And I can also see, see that on the diagram. On the diagram, there are two points away from the diagonal. This blue one, which is from H1, and this red one, 
which comes from H2. Uh, Rafael, are you writing? Yeah. Uh, it's not showing for us. Oh. Hmm. Let me try something. Can you see now? No. No, well, anyway, I was just saying that here and here are the two points uh, that are the most uh, prominent, the points the far furthest away from the diagonal. So when you want to read a persistent diagram, you look for these points, and then you interpret the homology of your underlying uh, object. Is it clear uh, until here? If you have any question, please ask. Okay, let's continue. Um, so last experiment uh, I'd like to show you. Um, here I want to verify, to observe the isometry theorem, right? Remember that the isometry theorem states that the bottleneck distance is lower than the Hausdorff distance. So up, the bottleneck distance between persistence modules is lower than the Hausdorff distance between the sets from which they come from. Here, I sample two data sets. X is this nice sample of the circle and Y is this noisy sample. Okay. I compute the, the RIPS filtrations of X and Y, okay, goody dot rips complex. So the points I give X over two. I set, I set a max edge length of two, just like that. And then I ask to create a simplex tree, okay, of maximal dimension two. This is a simplex tree and then I, uh, I can compute this persistence then. I do the same with Y and I plot the persistence diagrams. Okay. They look very similar. Um, the difference being that, well, you do not have topological noise in H1 for the set X, all right? While you have some noise here for the set Y. Uh, and in both uh, cases, you have some uh, H0 topological noise. So to uh, verify the, uh, the stability theorem, I will first compute the bottleneck distance between these barcodes. Okay. So to compute uh, bottleneck distance, first, you use uh, this function, persistence intervals in dimension zero, and I will take dimension one uh, after, meaning that I only take the intervals uh, in the zero barcode, okay? Barcode zero looks like that. So this correspond to all my red points here. Okay. I do the same with Y and I compute the bottleneck distance between these two barcodes, these two diagrams with this function, goody dot bottleneck distance. Okay, and then I print the value. It says 0 0.046. Lucas asked, can I uh, compute the interleaving distance? Um, 
where um, the <laughs> you, I mean, there, is, there are no algorithms to compute the voltaic, the interleaving distance from the algebraic definition, um, but it is equal to the to the bottleneck distance. <laughs> yeah, uh, you have to trust the theoretical result. Here, I do the same with the one barcode, right? Up, I obtain a bottleneck distance of 0 0.18. Uh, by the way, what is um, uh, the matching, the optimal matching of the bottleneck distance for H1? Uh, well, I guess we match this point with this one and all the little noise here will be matched to well to their projection on, on the diagonal to their midpoint okay and now well i i compute the osdorf distance with uh, scipy you have a function directed osdorf Okay, this gives you the, the Osdorf distance, and I get that the Osdorf distance is 0, 3. So we can say that the Osdorf distance, yeah, oof, this is greater than these bottleneck distances. Awesome. And if, yeah, if you don't trust me, you can uh, compute uh, different data sets. And, this is still the case here, 0, 4, 0, 2. All right, so I'll show you three things, how to build a filtration on your own, right? By inserting simplices one by one. Um, usually people use the second option, uh, ribs complex. This is a function of goodies that uh, creates for you the ribs complex. I show you how to uh, plot diagrams, barcodes, and also how to compute the uh, bottleneck distance between diagrams. Okay. Um, so this is an exercise for you. Fifty-four. Uh, remember this uh, paper uh, about cyclooctane molecules. Um, so the cyclooctane molecule is a molecule that contains, uh, wait, what is it, uh, 24 atoms, you, yeah, eight atoms of carbon and uh, 16 atoms of hydrogen. Uh, and when you generate a lot of molecules and take the coordinates of each of its atom, you obtain a point cloud in R to the 72, okay? and. Um, this point cloud uh, happens to have a nice topology, a sphere, uh, and a Klein bottle, right? So uh, we have this data set here, uh, though we do not have the positions of all the atoms, but only the carbon uh, atoms, right? So we actually have a, a, a point cloud in R to the eight times three, R to the 24. We have a lot of molecules generated and they uh, uh, saved the, 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 the position, the location of the carbon atoms. You can up, open the file with that. And let me check that it has the right shape. We have 6,040 points in R to the 24. Okay. Um, I want you to compute the persistent homology of the RIPS complex of this data set. Be careful because this is a, a huge data set. So um, build the RIPS filtration 
but uh, with a maximal edge length of 0 uh, dot 3. I mean, maybe you, your computer is very fast and you can take more than that. But on my computer, uh, more than 0 0.3 is um, uh, costly to compute. And we, we, we want to uh, observe the uh, homology up to dimension 2. So we have to add simplices up to dimension 3. Okay. And well, they say that in, in, in this paper, they obtain these multi numbers, 1, 1, 2. So I hope we will obtain the, the same here. So yeah, I, I, I'll let you do this uh, exercise. Tell me when you obtain something.
Do you obtain something? Hmm. All right. I will I will um, do the correction. Oh, some people got it. So, up. <clears throat> okay. Well. I will create a simplex tree that is the filtration, the rips filtration of my point cloud. So I will say rips calls to uh, goody that rips complex. And I say points equals to x over two. And yeah, max edge length. I follow the exercise is 0 0.3. Then I will build a, sim a simplex tree on top of these ribs. st equals to ribs that create simplex tree. And I precise what is the maximal dimension. I want to see uh, two homologies, so I have to add simplices up to dimension 3. Max dimension is three. Okay, and then barcode equals to st dot persistence. Um, and I will plot the barcode with the uh, say diagram. Okay, well, yeah, right. I, I should have, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I should have um, put here the, I think is that graph field. And as, as Lucas says, by default in Goody, the base uh, coefficient field is z over 11z. For some very mysterious reason, it's not z over 2z. So yeah, I add it here. Um, so what do we read on this um, diagram? There are some noise, right? And there are three, uh, four points that are on the infinite, infinite uh, value. One red point, one blue point, and two green points. Okay. Um, so the, uh, they are infinite because we stopped the filtration at the value 0 0.3. Okay. If we had taken a, a larger value, at some points, these cycles will have disappeared, right? They will uh, uh, have died. Um, but I cannot go too far on my computer, so I can just see that where well, they persisted until the end of the filtration. I guess these are the most prominent cycles, the most important cycles. Uh, so what I can conclude from here I only look at the most uh, important points. I see one red one, so H0, H0 
uh, has dimension one. Mm. Everyone up. I can say that H1 also has dimension one, only one blue point. Okay. And H2 has dimension two. I see two green points that corresponds to H2. And well, this is exactly what, what, what they, they obtain in, in this paper. So we are happy. Uh, they obtain these values with a way more sophisticated uh, uh, strategy. They computed a real triangulation for a fixed value uh, of thickening. They obtain really uh, some things that uh, has the um, uh, homomorphic type of the object. But we can read very simply on the persistence diagram, well, these important features. Let me see if this is clear also from the barcode. Well, yeah, this is not very nice. There must be some uh, red bars here, but this is so, so small, I cannot see anything. Hmm. All right, so I hope this worked uh, on your um, laptop, on your computer. This was a simple uh, computation of persistent homology. In the, the second example, uh, exercise 55, so I found this data on uh, this uh, website. So thank you, Matteo Reilly. Um, he studied, uh, uh, he studied uh, uh, the recordings of a flute and a clarinet playing a note. They were playing the note uh, A. And he wanted to uh, understand uh, if he can uh, discriminate between flute and clarinets for, uh, with persistent homology. Okay. So what, what he did is that uh, he took recordings of a flute and a clarinet, okay, and extracted the, the frequencies on this, uh, this software. So at the end, what you, what you obtain are two time series, right? Uh, a time series corresponding to the flute and one for the clarinet. Each of them uh, have, yeah, the first one has this many points and the second one, this many points. So in order to apply uh, persistent homology to a time series, a time series, we will use time delay embedding. So I give you a, a function here uh, that computes for you the time delay embedding of a time series. You give a time series an array and you obtain a point cloud, uh, a list of arrays. Okay. So compute all of that with me. We open the data set flute, we open the, open the data set clarinet. So for you to see how they look like, uh, in this cell, I plot just the very beginning of the two data sets, right? I plot the flute from zero to 1000 and same for the clarinet. And you can see uh, the beginning of, of, the, of the notes they play. So the, these are uh, 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 regular uh, periodic, kind of periodic signals, right? because this is a constant note. And uh, we will compute here a time delay embedding. Uh, a time delay embedding, not of the whole signal, because it's way too long, but just of a sample of 500 points, OK? I will take a sample of 500 points. Uh, I have to choose a starting point for this sample. I choose it at random. All right, this uh, line here, choose I, it is a starting point, point for my sample between zero and uh, the length of the data set. 
Okay, then I say my, that my sample is the data set from I to I plus 500. Um, then here I plot my sample. Then I compute the time delay embedding and I plot the time delay embedding. Okay. So this is a random sample of the flute. And this is the time delay embedding I obtained. Gabriel asked, if we had a recording with both instruments, is there a TDA technique for decomposing and isolate the instruments? Mm. Yeah, like if the signals were uh, mixed, were uh, added one to the other, this is a very interesting question. I don't really know. Can I guess I guess you can uh, ask this question mathematically um, from the time delay embedding, from the Takens embedding. Uh, can you recover the sum of two signals? If you sum two signals, can you say something about the time delay, delay embedding you obtain? Maybe. Uh, I never heard about that, but yeah, why not? Seems interesting. How, how does the topology of the time delay embedding changes? I don't know. Um, so this is, yeah, I, I took a random sample here. So of course, if you compute that again, you will obtain different uh, figures, right? But what you can see that there are some motifs, some shapes that, well, seem to appear again and again. This thing here. Okay. Let's do the same for the clarinet. Up. I select uh, a random sample and I plot the sample and it's tightly embedding. I obtain something like that. Let's compute again. And we obtain a, a, a set uh, that looks very different from the flute, right? Really looks like a circle. It's way more regular. Guillermo says that I can make a lot of money if I solve this problem. OK. I will try. No, actually, this is very, a very interesting question. Um, because basically, if you have a sinusoidal signal, what you get, what you get from the embedding is a circle. When you have a sum of uh, sinusoidals, you, you obtain, well, this kind of patterns. Um, and I don't, I guess you have, there are results about that. Well, and before letting you doing this ex the exercise, I will here uh, compute, compute the barcode of this data set. Okay. So this data set was called TDE as time delay embedding. So I create a RIPS of TDE over two. Yeah, I have to transpose because the time delay embedding function gives me the transpose of what I want. I set a max edge length of 0, 1. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's enough. I, I tried some values and 0, 1 it seems nice. And then I plot the persistence barcode and the persistence diagram of the corresponding uh, simplex tree. And I obtain. All right. Well, 
Okay, this is what I obtain. And well, it seems like this value zero one was way too, way too much um, because the persistence stops around zero, zero one. Anyway, what I can read is one, uh, two points far away from the two red points far away from the diagonal, the points at plus infinity, which represents the last connected component. And this point in red here that I guess correspond to these two points here, right? That are far away from, from the other points. So you have to wait a little bit for them to connect with the rest. Concerning the, the H1 homology, I see one point here away from the other. And this corresponds, I guess, to this circle here, right? Because we have a, a circle. Okay. So in this exercise, what I want you to do is uh, to try to uh, estimate the uh, mean number of uh, cycles that we have, okay? Here, for instance, I would say that we have three, four, maybe three or four uh, holes, right? So let me read the exercise. I want you to extract random samples of 500 consecutive points for the flute and the clarinet, okay? I want you to embed them into our two uh, with time delay embedding, so exactly what I've done here, uh, here, with the same parameters. Then I want you to compute the H1 barcode of their RIPS filtration. So uh, be careful with this parameter max edge length. Maybe, yeah, zero one is too much, I don't know. Um, then I want you to keep only the cycles with persistence greater than 0015. And I want you to call them cycles with large persistence, okay? So for instance, in this diagram, you will look at all the points and keep only the points with uh, persistence, that is length greater than 0015. Um, okay. and. Uh, compute the number of such uh, cycles. And at the end, do it for many samples. Um, I mean, this will take a lot of time, so do it only for five or, or 10 or 15 samples, I don't know. And compute the mean number, the mean of uh, the number of cycles with large persistence, okay. Then, yeah, the idea is that uh, um, we will find two very different values for the clarinet and the flute, okay? The clarinet will have uh, a lot of persisting cycles, uh, while the flute, no, yeah, this is the flute. It is topologically more complicated than the, the clarinets, which, well, looks like circles every time. Okay, I let you five to, to ten minutes, and, and you can you can ask me in in the chat uh, if you want some help.
All right. How is it going? Okay. <clears throat> um, I will show you my um, my solution. So, um, okay, it's here. Can you see if I write right now? I'm drawing on the notebook. No. No. Uh, Uh, up, change. And what about now? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I asked uh, you to compute the number of cycles with large persistence for a few samples of each instrument. I start here with the flute. So I uh, define this um, list here. OK, I will take 10 samples. I uh, Let's say I take just five for the example. I create this list where I will put the number of uh, cycles with large persistence okay and so as just before i compute i choose a random sample of my signal and sample i embed this time series into r2 with the function time delay embedding then I compute here the RIPS complex of this pan cloud and uh, its persistence. So I want, I only consider, uh, I, I want to study only one homology. So I compute the uh, simplex tree up to dimension two. Okay. And then you have this um, piece of code that is supposed to compute the number of cycles with persistence larger than 0, 0, 0015. Um, well, how does that work? ST persistence interval in dimension one. So this is a list of uh, all the intervals, okay, in my um, barcode. So I compute this list, PERS. Uh, so PERS is the persistence of each cycle. Okay, For each bar in the barcode, I compute its death time minus its birth time. OK? And then I simply compute the sum of it. Uh, being lower, uh, greater than the value I asked. Yep. And okay, so I I do that uh, many times for many samples. And what I uh, got just before was two point five. All right. 1.8 now. OK, and the clarinet, this is exactly the same. Um, so the problem here is that the, the, the clarinet points are uh, closer to each other. And if I take the same uh, max edge length, I obtain very uh, large simplex trees, and this is very long to compute. 
so I changed change it for 0, 0, 5. Okay. And, and, and in my experiments here, I always obtain 0 as a mean, uh, meaning that I actually don't have uh, persisting cycles with large persistence for the flips. Um, um, yeah. So this is strange because yesterday I obtained a, a different result. Maybe I, ch I changed the this value here. So basically, uh, um, yeah. So you can see here uh, uh, that we obtain different values of uh, persisting cycles for the flute and the clarinets. Well, this would be uh, uh, meaningful if we did it on a large number of samples, right? Um, Rafael, did yeah. you notice that, that you have different, uh, can you go down a little bit? You have different, uh, different uh, max edge length, 0.1 and 0.05 between the flute and clarinet. Yeah. So this is because um, you can see this, this uh, clarinet uh, data set um, points are uh, closer to each other than uh, for the flute. And, and well, it depends. Um, but when I, com well, when, I, when I compute the persistence of the clarinet, well, Okay, what well, I want to say that the, the problem with um, <clears throat> uh, RIPS complexes is that they can be very, very large. You may have a, a lot of uh, simplices. And uh, so what you want is to choose a value of max edge length large enough to see homology, but, but small enough to be still computable, to not be too costly. and. Um, I just remarked that in the case of the clarinet, this max edge length is enough to see uh, interest uh, homology appearing. See, I, I put here, well, well, I just read in the diagram that homology, you have, you have uh, topological events up to 0, zero 015. So I could have choose 0, zero 015, but just to be sure, I put 0, zero five, and we obtain the same persistence diagram. So was a different max edge length in order to simplify the computations. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, it does. Okay. Because we are not looking for a comparison for with the same max length, but we are comparing the topology. So we use the one that give us the, be the better picture, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, it, if I put here uh, 0, 0, 001, I will obtain the same result because uh, topology stops changing from some very small value here. You can see in the diagram from 0, 0, 015, uh, you, you have just a big ball and nothing uh, happens more. So actually, you obtain the same results by choosing a smaller max edge length. It's just faster to compute. And I wanted to comment uh, this value, um, 0, 0, 15. So in practice, uh, um, so some people do, uh, does that, choosing uh, some uh, threshold value and considering only uh, homological features that are with persistence above this value. And this value uh, should, must have a, a, a scientific meaning, right? So here, this may be in seconds. Um, so, I mean, uh, you will represent some uh, a musical uh, frequency, some, uh, some things that make sense for the person who analyzes this data set because when I do the experiment here, I took this value 0, 0, 0,015 because I think it, it was nice. I thought it was nice, but this does not have any 
scientific meaning, right? Um, so this is where uh, your uh, scientific expertise is uh, needed when using persistent homology. For, for instance, se selectioning a threshold, uh, this is this can be done at random. I mean, you can do statistics if you don't have a lot of ideas, but this is quite uh, arbitrary. I mean, this value 0, 0, 15. All right. Um, do you have any question about this exercise? No? Okay. Um, so it's already, yeah, okay. I will, I will, we will uh, see the last exercise uh, together. Um, so this is, uh, well, let's go to the correction directly. This is the same idea here. Uh, we will study um, time series. All right, where is it? Okay, time series. So um, these data are uh, from uh, three people. They went around someday with their phone in their pocket and the phones um, recorded the acceleration data of the persons, All right? You have three persons, A, B, C, and they, uh, with the phone in the pocket recording acceleration, you obtain, so acceleration has three coordinates, X, Y, Z. So for each, each person, you obtain a time series in dimension three, okay? So this the three accelerations. Um, what is complicated with this data set is that the persons uh, did not put their phone uh, in the same uh, sense in their pockets. And even more, the phone may move a little bit during the day. Um, so you cannot use usual uh, techniques of comparison of uh, uh, time series. Here we will do a time delay embedding. Uh, no, I think we, we won't even do a time delay embedding. We will just compute. Oh yeah. Uh, so No, no. We will just take the three dimensional time series as it is and uh, consider the corresponding point cloud in R3. Okay, let me show you that. Um, so I import the data set here. I have the three persons, data A, data B, and data C. And data A. Oh. Import the D. Okay. So um, this large um, time series has been divided into time series of a hundred points. Okay. So the first person uh, corresponds to two hundred time series. Each time series having a hundred points and these points being in R3, okay? And we want to, uh, well, understand the topology or use this topology, the topology of uh, this time series to classify them, okay? And here, so um, I consider the first sample of uh, the time series corresponding to the first person. This is a point cloud. You can see the time series as a point cloud in R3, okay? And this is what I plot here. The edges representing the, the movement, the consecutive points, okay? And well, let's consider the ribs complex of this point cloud. I compute its persistence diagram here. And well, as you can see, this does not seem to have a very interesting topology, right? Looks like a random sample of points. 
uh, and even in the persistence diagram, I, I mean, looks like everything is noise, right? Uh, however, uh, even if this looks like noise, it contains some topological information, right? Of some geometrical information, I should say, about how uh, the points are distant. Uh, do we have uh, areas of accumu accumulation? Uh, do we have clusters, stuff like that? A lot of geometrical information, uh, geometric information is included in this persistence diagram, okay? And so, well, you can use persistence diagrams to compare the samples between each other. And this is what I do here. Uh, for each person, I take 60 samples of their uh, time series, right? I compute the rib complex. And then uh, for the three times 60 barcodes I have, I compute their um, bottleneck distance. So I have a, a huge distance matrix. And this matrix should represent a topological kind of distance between uh, the movements of A, B, and C. Okay. And here, so I represented it with um, um, MDS, I forgot what is it, Manif dimensionality. It's, it's a method of uh, dimensionality reduction, uh, MDS. How is it called? Uh, Multidimensional scaling. Multidimensional scaling. Well, it's just a way of represents of representing points when you are given a distance matrix. Okay. And well, this is what you obtain. Um, well, I, I should. Mm. Unfortunately, I cannot turn around the, the plots, but. Um, well, it looks like looks like we can define some uh, some nice clusters, right? Person uh, A in magenta, person B in blue, a person uh, C in green. Okay. So, conclusion: This is an example where we use a barcode uh, not as a tool to um, really extract topological information, but just like a a big bag of, of features, like, like some nice descriptors of the geometry of my point cloud. And it turns out that it can be very useful to classify, uh, for instance. Okay. We will stop here. Um, do I... Yeah, well, I have a last slide. Up. So, well, uh, uh, so this is the, the end. Um, I would like to close uh, the summer course by thanking all of you. It was very nice. I hope you learned interesting things. And for those who are interesting uh, to know more about this theory, uh, um, I would like to say that there are many areas, many branches uh, to go uh, from the most uh, uh, fundamental uh, algebraic topology uh, methods, right? Um, this is very interesting to discover uh, this, this uh, theory of algebraic topology. Even in, in pure math, it's still a hot topic, right? And more specifically, the theory of persistent homology itself uh, uh, has many areas where we do not really know how it behaves, what to do, what to understand. Uh, um, and also from a topology inference point of view many methods to invent and uh, also applications uh, um, this is very important i guess how to uh, 
apply persistent homology on which data sets and, and how to interpret persistent homology. What does barcode mean? Uh, when is it useful? When is it interesting to, to compute barcodes? Uh, it's also uh, an area where a lot of progress uh, have to be made. Right? And well, I'm uh, very happy to give you all your uh, certificate of uh, persistent homology. And thank you again uh, very much. <laughs> By the way, you, you have my email when you when you want to contact me, reach me. Uh, I, I will be very happy. <laughs>